Welcome back to a new session on ethics. Here we discuss ethical theory of Herbert Spencer. Evolutionary ethics tries to bridge the gap between philosophy and the natural sciences by arguing that natural selection has instilled human beings with a moral sense, a disposition to be good. If this were true, morality could be understood as a phenomenon that arises automatically during the evolution of sociable intelligent beings and not as theologians or philosophers might argue as the result of divine revelation or the application of our rational faculties. Morality would be interpreted as a useful adaptation that increases the fitness of its holders by providing a selective advantage. Spencer, Theory of Moral Good Herbert Spencer was a social evolutionist without question, but he was never crudely social Darwinist. He was what we now refer to as a liberal utilitarian first who traded heavily in evolutionary theory in order to explain how our liberal utilitarian sense of justice emerges. Though a utilitarian, Spencer took distributive justice no less seriously than Mill. For him, as for Mill, liberty and justice were equivalent. Whereas Mill equated fundamental justice with his liberty principle, Spencer equated justice with equal liberty which holds that liberty of each limited by the like liberty of all is the rule in conformity with which society must be organized. Moreover, for Spencer as for Mill, liberty was sacrosanct ensuring that his utilitarianism was equally a bona fide form of liberalism. In his view, gaining pleasure and avoiding pain directs all human action. Hence, moral good can be equated with facilitating human pleasure. Second, pleasure can be achieved in two ways. First, by satisfying self-regarding impulses and second, by satisfying other regarding impulses. This means that Eating one's favorite food and giving food to others are both pleasurable experiences for humans. Third, mutual cooperation between humans is required to coordinate self and other regarding impulses, which is why humans develop principles of equity to bring altruistic and egoistic traits into balance. Spencer elevated alleged biological facts struggle for existence, natural selection, survival of the fittest, etc., to prescriptions for moral conduct. For instance, he suggested that life is a struggle for human beings and that in order for the best to survive, it is necessary to pursue a policy of non-aid for the weak. To aid the bad in multiplying is, in effect, the same as maliciously providing for our descendants a multitude of enemies. Spencer's philosophy was widely popular, particularly in North America in the 19th century, but declined significantly in the 20th century. Evolutionary Ethics Spencer alleged that evolution equaled progress for the better, that is in the moral sense of word, and that anything which supported evolutionary forces would therefore be good. The reasoning behind this was that nature shows us what is good by moving towards it and hence evolution is a process which in itself generates value. If evolution advances the moral good, we ought to support it out to self-interest. Moral good was previously identified with universal human pleasure and happiness by Spencer. If the evolutionary process directs us towards this universal pleasure, we have an egoistic reason for being moral, namely that we want universal happiness. However, to equate development with moral progress for the better was a major value judgment which cannot be held without further evidence and most evolutionary theorists have given up on the claim. Theory of Moral Rights 
Spencer took moral rights seriously. Moral rights to life and liberty are conditions of general happiness. They guarantee each individual the opportunity to exercise his or her faculties according to his or her own lights, which is the source of real happiness. Moral rights can't make us happy, but merely gives us the equal chance to make ourselves happy as best we can. They consequently promote general happiness indirectly. Basic moral rights emerge as intuitions too, though they are more specific than our generalized intuitive appreciations of the utilitarian competence of equal freedom. Consequently, self-consciously internalizing and refining our intuitive sense of equal freedom, transforming it into a principle of practical reasoning, simultaneously transforms our emerging normative intuitions about the sanctity of life and liberty into severe juridical principles. And this is simply another way of claiming that general utility flourishes well wherever liberal principles are seriously invoked. Moral societies are happier societies and more vibrant and successful to both. Morality, properly so-called, the science of right conduct has for its object to determine how and why certain modes of conduct are injurious and certain other modes are beneficial. These good and bad results cannot be accidental, but must be necessary consequences of the constitution of things. It is the business of moral science to deduce from the laws of life and the conditions of existence what kinds of action necessarily tend to produce happiness and what kinds to produce unhappiness. Having done this, its deductions are to be recognized as laws of conduct and are to be confirmed to irrespective of a direct estimation of happiness or misery. Moral rights to life and liberty secure our most vital opportunities for making ourselves as happy as we possibly can. Rational Utilitarianism Spencer advocates indirect utilitarianism by featuring robust moral rights. Spencer referred to his own brand of utilitarianism as rational utilitarianism, which he claimed improved upon Bentham's inferior empirical utilitarianism. In identifying himself as a rational utilitarian, Spencer distanced himself decidedly from social Darwinism. He agreed with Huxley that though ethics can be evolutionarily explained, Ethics nevertheless preempts normal struggle for existence with the arrival of humans. Humans invest evolution with an ethical check, making human evolution qualitatively different from non-human evolution. Rational utilitarianism constitutes the most advanced form of ethical checking in so far as it specifies the equitable limits to his, that is, the individual's activities and of the restraints which must be imposed upon him in his interactions with others. In short, once we begin systematizing our inchoate utilitarian intuitions with the principle of equal freedom and its derivative moral rights, we begin checking evolutionary struggle for survival with unprecedented skill and subtlety. We self-consciously invest our utilitarianism with stringent liberal principles in order to advance our well-being as never before. For both Mill and Spencer, rights-oriented utilitarianism best fosters general happiness because individuals succeed in making themselves happiest when they develop their mental and physical faculties by exercising them as they deem most appropriate which in turn requires extensive freedom. But since we live socially, what we practically require is equal freedom suitably fleshed out in terms of its moral right corollaries. Moral rights to life and liberty secure our